Glad to have you with us today as we continue our study of the New Testament and the ministry of Jesus. We are looking at the events of Palm Sunday as we go through the series, God's Hand in Our Lives, in our Sunday School series. So, as we learn about this um, story, we are going to be looking at the way that Jesus began entering into Jerusalem. Um, so, to kind of get us in the right mindset, I want to ask you guys a question. Think about someone important or famous, like a movie star or maybe a professional athlete. How are they kind of um, introduced? Now, let, let's say... Mm -hmm. Yeah. You Now, think about it. Are there crowds cheering? In when you think about that entrance, I would I would say that there probably would be. Um, think about a movie star. What's that? What's that uh, phrase that you you would use for a celebrity or a movie star? They're walking down the red carpet. Mm hmm. Something really special for them to walk on. So you have people snapping photos. If it's at a, a sporting event, you got people cheering. Um, Lots of people excited just to get to see them. And we'll see that this happened for Jesus as well. But at the same time, it was also compared to what other kings would have for being introduced or making an entrance. It was pretty lowly and very humble as well. Right. So as we get into this lesson on Palm Sunday and we see how Jesus is revealed to us as our king, but a different kind of king than those that we find in the world, we're going to really appreciate all that Jesus has done in humility to redeem us from our sin. Mm -hmm. Why don't you join us this morning as we begin, bow your heads and we'll start with prayer. Dear Lord God, our, our Father in heaven, Many years ago, you sent your son Jesus into this world. Today, we are going to study how Jesus was received by this world. Help us to understand and appreciate the important work that your son did for us. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, Palm Sunday, it's probably something that you guys have learned a little bit about, or maybe at least heard it. It's something that happens every year. Um, it's what we call the beginning of something called Holy Week. And what that is, is um, Jesus' last week here on earth, um, as, as what he came to do. Um, so... He's on his way to Jerusalem with his disciples, and he's not quite in Jerusalem yet when this happens. Um, but the exciting thing is that up until now, so he's at the very end of his earthly ministry because he's about to be crucified um, and to die and then to rise again. Um, they've been kind of keeping it hush-hush when it comes to Jesus's Godhead and the ultimate power that he has and who exactly he is and what he came to do. So this is a, a triumphant entrance that they have. It's They are announcing Jesus' power and his Godhead and um, everyone's getting excited because they, they're acknowledging him as the promised one. Um, we'll also kind of talk about how while they were excited, they also didn't fully grasp exactly what it was that Jesus came to do. Um, it's It was hard for them to, for a lot of them, not all of them, to see exactly um, how Jesus didn't come for an earthly kingdom and an earthly rule. He came for something even greater, and that's an eternal rule with with us in heaven and the new earth. Yeah, this, this day, it was on a Sunday, is often called Palm Sunday, and we're going to see why. Because instead of, like Michael said, rolling out the red carpet, they're going to do something very different. That That's traditional maybe in our culture. Mm -hmm. It was something very different in their culture, and yet they're going to honor Jesus in a similar way by cutting down 
palm branches and laying them down on the road as Jesus begins this last week of his earthly ministry. You'll notice, and we've done this again before in previous lessons, but you'll notice that this lesson isn't just taken from one of the four Gospels. Mm -hmm. This is what we sometimes call a, a harmony. And we're taking all four of the Gospels and we're kind of weaving them together in order to get the full picture of what happened on this Palm Sunday, this mm -hmm. first first uh, day as Jesus begins the last week of his ministry. So we're going to get into the, the account here recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and by John. We'll read the first section. Jesus and the disciples drew near to Jerusalem, and it came to pass when he came near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where, as you enter, you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her on which no one has ever sat. Loose them and bring them here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing them? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them here. So a couple of things to remember as we're going through this, as Michael mentioned, this is just a, a little bit of the journey that Jesus is making as he's getting ready to go into Jerusalem. So if you kind of think about it from, from a geography standpoint, a geography is looking at the lay of the land, Jerusalem was up on a hill. And just outside of the hill, there was a little valley, and it was called the Kidron Valley, and then it would go up on another mountain that was called the Mount of Olives before it would go all the way back down to Bethany and Bethphage. And so this journey that we're going to be talking about was between the Mount of Olives, down into the Kidron Valley, and then back up into Jerusalem. That's where Jesus was going and he's going to ride then on this donkey that we're going to mm -hmm. hear about. Yeah, and we'll kind of get a picture of how that was different um, it compared to other kings and how how that entrance of Jesus's was um, not as um, exalted as it probably should have been. Yeah, if you think about uh, the famous people that you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, a famous athlete or an actor or somebody mm -hmm. like that. If they're going to pull up to some big event, what do you think they're going to be driving? Something that I could never afford. Okay. Uh, so in those days, that if you were to compare that today, you know, you might think about a limousine. You know, maybe it's a, a giant uh, limousine. And like Michael said, we can't afford one of those. And that would be compared to maybe a, um, a little subcompact car, you know, made by Ford. Well, there's a big difference between those two cars. Mm -hmm. You know, one's all rusty and beat up, and the other one is, is brand new, and, and it's very expensive. And so if a, a king in those days were going to be riding into a city, what kind of a, what kind of a car do you think he would ride in on? Well, firstly, probably something that most people couldn't afford. Maybe um, multiple horses yeah. pulling. Yeah. Um, something special maybe yeah. about the horses, like yeah. a, all white or mm -hmm. something like that. Napoleon was known for riding on a white horse. Mm -hmm. So something that was striking and powerful. Mm -hmm. But Jesus, while he rides into Jerusalem, didn't do so on a series of horses or just even a horse, but rather... Not even on a donkey, but mm -hmm. the Gospels tell us the, the foal uh, or the baby, the colt of a donkey. So mm -hmm. it's a young one that had never been ridden on before. That was a beast of burden, not, a, not an animal of prestige and power. Mm -hmm. Very different. And that's where we see the humility of Jesus. So let's talk about how Jesus knew that there was going to be this, this donkey and, and this colt there um, waiting and what exactly the disciples should say to them. Now, there's a couple of theories out, and one of them is that Jesus just knew, um, and he, he knew that exactly where they were going to be, and he knew without going over there what they should say, and he worked some of his divinity into um, getting those animals. And while that is entirely possible. Jesus could do that. He is God. Um, 
we don't actually know for sure. So when we go into scriptures and we are reading them and studying them, we want to not add anything to scripture. Um, and what that could what that could look like is taking a, a piece of scripture and with the, reading the context and everything and adding something that isn't for sure 100% there. Um, and even though Jesus could very well do that, we don't actually know. So we don't want to say this is exactly what happened. Jesus used his divinity because for all we know, he could have just came there a week before and or maybe he knew this person and had arranged that at a previous date. So while it's possible that this could have been Jesus' divine nature working, um, we don't actually know. And And just to be clear... Just because this example right here, we can't, we can't specifically say, well, this demonstrates his divinity, doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we don't have other sections of Scripture that yeah, do absolutely. reveal the fact that he was divine. Yep. So it's not taking anything away from Jesus. Could it be an example of the fact that he he just knew if they just went to this place, there would be this person, and, and he was showing his omniscience? Mm -hmm. That's very possible. Uh, but it might also have been that he knew a certain family that had uh, and they that he had been to before, and he knew that they would have the animals. We're going to see another example of this later on in Holy Week, where Jesus does very clearly reveal his omniscience mm -hmm. in leading his disciples to a certain place at a certain time for a certain reason. So mm -hmm. we see all kinds of of good examples like that. Yeah. Um, so we we only bring that up because it's uh, it's a good tool to use as a Christian because we don't want we don't want to add any more to the Bible and we don't want to take any more away from the Bible. So it's it can be challenging sometimes, but that's why we do classes like this and we go into it and we talk about it and and that's how we get that right. complete truth from Jesus. Right. Well let's let's take a look at what happens then and we're gonna see in the next section, Michael, that what has just taken place, how Jesus sends them to get the donkey, this is in order to fulfill mm -hmm. the promises that God has made in the Old Testament. And we're going to have in the next section a quote from the Old Testament that was 300 or more years, well, this had been 700 years earlier mm -hmm. at the time of Zechariah. And so we've got a pretty good example of the fact that God had been waiting for this very thing to, to take place. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing thing how these these um, prophecies from that God had given people so many years before, as Jesus goes on throughout his entire life, we see each one of those being fulfilled in perfection. Right. Um, and so when Jesus says at the, when he is eventually crucified five days from this day, he says it is finished, and that means that those prophecies had been fulfilled, which is another example right. of his divinity. Sure, so absolutely. we don't have it exactly right in that passage, but he, just like Pastor said, we have tons of examples. And it's a really neat thing how even something as small as riding a donkey into Jerusalem was predicted so many years before and right. just is another shout to everybody, to you and me, um, that Jesus is Lord, and we can trust in Him. Absolutely. So let's see what this has to say then. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, the colt, the foal of a donkey. So that was our prophecy, the tell your daughter of Zion, um, all the way down to the end of that paragraph. That was what was predicted so many years before um, by the prophet Zechariah. In fact, if you have your Bibles and you open up to this reference, if you notice at the top of your, your Bible study there, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the, the verses that you can look to where this account is taking place. Mm -hmm. And if you find one of those Gospels where this verse is taking place, you might find a cross-reference in your Bible. And that cross-reference will tell you that these words were spoken in the Old Testament by the prophet Zechariah. And so you can actually go back to Zechariah and you can see that those exact same words were mm -hmm. spoken by Zechariah and the disciples came to realize that when this event took place, afterwards, after Jesus had died and rose again, they said, ah, oh, 
This was in fulfillment of what Zechariah wrote. Mm -hmm. They realized that that's exactly what Jesus was doing and who he was, that he was a king, a king that was coming in humility. Mm -hmm. So those who were sent departed and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. And they let them go. Then they brought them to Jesus, and they threw their own garments on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, a very great multitude came out to meet him. They spread their garments on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the palm trees and spread them onto the road. So this is the actual part of the account where we get the term Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. And this would have been on Sunday just before, what, as Michael said, the beginning of, of what we call Holy Week. And notice the people are coming out of Jerusalem to greet Jesus as he's coming into mm -hmm. town. And they acknowledge him as the one they've been waiting for. They acknowledge him as their king. And we're going to see that later on, some of the songs that they're singing, quoting from the Old Testament, again, just like with Zechariah, pointing to what they believed about Jesus and who they believed Jesus really was. Yeah. I would like to add, by the way, that Palm Sunday sounds a lot better than Garment Sunday. So I, I'm glad, glad we went with that one. Um, so right at the beginning there, you you have the disciples going, and Jesus was right when he said that there'll be some people there, and all you got to tell them is that the Lord has need of them. And that's exactly what ended up happening. They got the donkey, um, and it, it's kind of a kind of a neat thing where you, the it says the disciples put their own garments on the colt, and they didn't even let Jesus sit himself down onto the donkey. They put him onto, onto this donkey. Um, and not even just the disciples, the, these people that are coming mm -hmm. out to greet them were the ones cutting down the palm branches and laying their own clothes down. So this is kind of a neat example of sacrificial love. Um, it's, it's probably the hardest type of love out there. Um, and we, we see it time and time again throughout the scriptures of Jesus's sacrificial love for us. Right. Jesus pretty much, he was constantly emanating this sacrificial love. Everything he did, said, um, was for the benefit of you, the disciples, and us. Keep in mind, too, that the palm branches, that might not seem like that's all that significant to us, mm -hmm. but in that culture, the palm branch was a, a figure or a symbol of victory. Oh. So when they would lay those down on the road, it was they were proclaiming and announcing, yes, we know that Jesus is the victor, the one who is going to bring victory for us. Now, there were probably some on that day that had a wrong understanding of what kind of victory Jesus was going to bring. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people that wanted Jesus to defeat the Romans who had uh, the power over the people of, of Israel and, and Jerusalem. But that's not the kind of authority or kingdom Jesus came to rule over. He was a very different kind of king as seen in, again, that little donkey that he was riding in on as opposed to a great white horse or a series of horses. So Jesus was coming for a different purpose, not to defeat the Romans, but to defeat the devil, mm -hmm. sin, and even death. Much, much bigger enemy. Much more lasting enemy, too. And right. uh, it's As you go through the scriptures, um, you'll notice lots of times where people aren't fully understanding what Jesus' real mission is. Um, you know, you have these examples of previous lessons that we've done with, the, like, the feeding of the 5,000. They, they were listening to Jesus, but they weren't really hearing what he was saying because they wanted to make him an earthly king. A lot of Jews at this time, they had the idea that when the Messiah would come, he would set up an earthly rule. And just as Pastor said, what they imagined that would be is that they would take down the Romans because at the time the Romans had the were leading the government. They were the ones that were in control. So 
these the people had this great love for Jesus and they were acknowledging that he was someone pretty special and maybe they didn't fully understand all the way but they had a good idea but the thing is, is that they they assumed that Jesus was going to act a certain way right um, and, and and in their defense they had been taught that Mm-hmm. They had been taught that over the years that that's the kind of savior that they should expect. Mm-hmm. So, for the disciples, they had to relearn the scriptures and understand them in the way that God intended as opposed yeah. to the way that they had been taught. And that's a good reminder for us, Michael, as you pointed out earlier, of, of studying the scriptures in order to yeah. understand the context that God doesn't want us to just trust anybody else and what they say about God or about His, His Word but to go back and to study His Word for ourselves, to search the Scriptures, Mm -hmm. to see what they're telling us is the truth. Uh, That is really the goal that the Lord wants us all to do, to know the Scriptures well enough to know when what we are being taught is true or when it is false. Yeah, unfortunately, that's something that we have to always be very careful of. Even at your own church, um, nobody is perfect, and we want to always be paying attention and comparing the things that were taught um, to what the Bible says. So it's really awesome and important when we can do different things like this and we can go more in depth on it. And even earlier in this story when we said, well, people might say that Jesus, you, he told the disciples out of his divine knowledge, which very well could have been, but we don't actually know. So we don't want to say that he did. Um, that type of thing is what we want to be careful of. Even something small like that, um, because we want to know what Jesus is telling us. Right. We Now, we have something that these guys didn't have. We have the completed scriptures and gospels. Um, so we know what Jesus came to do, and we know when he comes again what he's coming to do. Um, but there are still chances and times for us to misunderstand scriptures right so this is good that we're going well as we go on in the next section we're going to see again how the the people look to the old testament to see who jesus is and what they declare about jesus Mm -hmm. we're going to get a couple of other old testament references in in the next section as well so we go on in that in the first column Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord! The King of Israel! Hosanna in the highest! You know, I think it's kind of helpful. If you look in your books, you'll see that um, that that top section on the second column, the Hosanna to the Son of David, it's in quotations. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's because it's the reference to the Old Testament. It's from Psalm 118. Um, If you look at your Bibles as you're reading through, you're going to start noticing now certain passages in your Bible that look different than the rest of the words. They'll be maybe italicized in quotations, um, sometimes written in a different format, um, almost like a poem down the column. And whenever that is the case, that's when they're quoting something from the Old Testament. And so that's something that you can find as you read the Old Testament. And so if you're reading your Bibles at home or at church, Sunday school, and you see something like that, you can know that that's a prophecy that is being fulfilled by Jesus. Um, or later on in the epistles, it's something that they're using to better understand what Jesus had come to do. Right. And, and so just so you know, too, as Michael pointed out, there's different ways that different Bibles do that. So your Bible might be different than somebody else's Bible. So some of them might indent, some of them might italicize, some of them might put them in all capital letters. And you just kind of have to get familiar with your own Bible and the way in which the editors of your Bible chose to highlight that portion and make it set off or different from the rest of the narrative that's in your Bible. So Mm -hmm. the more comfortable and the more familiar you get with your Bible, the more you will begin to see and understand how that works and what to look for as you're Mm -hmm. studying your Bible. 
may not seem important now, right? but this is one of our awesome, awesome, powerful tools that we have as Christians. Um, obviously, it's God's Word that has all that power, and if you can better flip through your Bible, whether that's memorizing the books of the Bible or understanding when something is from the Old Testament um, being referenced or not, that's or even Jesus his words, um, they might be a different color, they might not be. It's, it's all really helpful stuff in helping us to better understand the scriptures and to hear what God's trying to tell us through them. Right. So the people here, the crowd that's coming out to meet Jesus, they know that Jesus is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. So they recognize who Jesus is. And a couple of things that are really important in there, they call Jesus the son of David. Mm -hmm. That's a very important term in the Old Testament that was used to describe the Messiah, the Christ. So Jesus is sometimes called Jesus the Christ or Jesus Christ. That was the same word. Christ is the same as Messiah in the Hebrew. So they were admitting that Jesus was the one that God promised us in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And so the son of David, that speaks about it. But he also talks about a kingdom, the kingdom of David that is going to be the one that Jesus is going to bring. And like we talked about earlier, that didn't mean an earthly kingdom. Mm -hmm. That meant the kingdom of heaven, which Jesus spoke about so often in his ministry. The kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. Mm -hmm. People should have known Jesus didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom. He came to establish something more important. Yeah. How lame would that be if Jesus established an earthly kingdom? I mean, if you think about it, it might sound cool at first. Like, ooh, you probably have this really awesome castle and Jesus in it. And you can come up to see him and there might be lots of riches and different things to see. But what do we know about the earth? Anything that we have, anything that we can think of, it wears away. Our world is affected by this thing called sin. And because of that, everything is gradually, slowly dying. So any kingdom that Jesus could build, establish here on earth, isn't one that would last forever. But Jesus, thankfully, is establishing his kingdom, not on this earth, this sin-affected earth, but in heaven and the new earth, um, where things don't wear away, things don't erode or get rusty or get old and dirty and smelly. It's perfect and lasts forever. That's pretty awesome. Now, sadly, I mean, everything up to this point has sounded really, really good. Mm -hmm. The disciples and all of these people coming out of Jerusalem and they're all worshiping Jesus, but we're going to see in the next section that not everybody was happy about what was taking place here. So we go on in the next section here. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. What's going on here, Michael? We got the infamous Pharisees that we talk a whole lot about. These are people who don't want... Jesus to be called the Christ, the Son of God. They don't believe that Jesus is the Son of David. Um, they don't believe that he has come in the name of the Lord. They think that he's being blasphemous or lying about who he is. So they want to keep him quiet. And they don't like how all these people are worshiping Jesus and laying down these palm branches, a sign of victory, down for Jesus and their clothes and cheering him on and getting excited. So they want everybody to stop. They need it to stop. So they tell Jesus, you need to keep these guys silent. Rebuke your disciples. But it's pretty interesting what Jesus says here. He pretty much says, even if I hush up my disciples, you can't keep this quiet. Even these stones would cry out if they weren't. And, and this goes back to what Michael mentioned earlier, that over the last few lessons that we've been studying, time and time again we've seen Jesus tell his own disciples as they have seen his glory being revealed, for example, at the Transfiguration mm -hmm. or different times in his ministry. He said, shh, don't tell anybody. 
But that's changed here now on Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. Now he's no longer telling them, shh, don't tell anybody who I am. Now he says, even if I were to tell my disciples to be quiet, the stones would cry out. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is now a change in the ministry of Jesus, that he was there to announce exactly who he was. There were still people who misunderstood, mm -hmm. but he was no longer going to hush the message of who he was. And it was going to boldly be proclaimed that Jesus was coming as king, the king of all creation and the savior of all mankind. What a pretty neat thing for that to finally be out. Um, he had good reasons for not having it come out before right. um, with how people would respond and not quite fully understand. And But now we finally get to have it out. So I, I would imagine it being sort of a bittersweet moment, at least for, I don't know, for Jesus maybe. He knew he, you have this nice entrance. And even though it's not as exalted as a king would have it's um it's still people are acknowledging him who he is but he has in the back of his mind what he is really on this earth to do and that's to suffer and die and take on the sins of the entire world including you and including us um this is this is the start of the end of his life um on earth and just one thing to keep in mind too that Part of this change that we've seen in Jesus, the fact that he was allowing the disciples to do this would be the very thing that would ultimately bring about his death. So now, mm -hmm. you know, Jesus had been avoiding them stoning him or throwing him off of cliffs throughout his ministry. But now he wasn't going to stop that. He was going to allow it to happen because that's exactly what he came to do. And now the time was ready. It was right mm -hmm. for him to go to suffer and to die. And it wouldn't be by stoning. And it wouldn't be by being thrown off a cliff. It would be by crucifixion, which we'll study in a couple of lessons. Yeah. Let's go on and let's take the last section of this particular account. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple. So when he had looked around at all the things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Kind of a strange conclusion to a wonderful and very exciting day. Yeah. Um, you have another example of people not quite fully understanding who Jesus was, what he came to do. Um, I mean, you have the people who didn't know who Jesus was, and so they're asking, they're going up and saying, who is this Jesus character that everyone is r raving and ranting about? And so they're like, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. So while Jesus is a prophet, he's not just a prophet. So they don't fully quite understand. Um, some of them probably did, but at least these ones didn't understand who exactly Jesus was. Um, which was, it was a little bit sad, but right. hopefully, just like the disciples didn't get it then, but they got it later, hopefully that was the same case for them too. Yeah. So this, this lesson does a couple of things for us. When we take a look at just the lesson itself, we see that Jesus rides into Jerusalem, and he rides into Jerusalem as a king. He mm -hmm. proclaims himself to be a king, but not just any kind of king, not an earthly king. He rides into Jerusalem in humility, on a donkey, and not in the way that a typical king would come. Mm -hmm. and we also see something deeper in this lesson, and that is that Jesus comes as the Son of God for you and for me. He comes in humility in order to save us from our sins. Jesus knew exactly where he was going from here. He knew that he was going to the cross, and that this would be just one more part of it, but he was declaring that he was the one who God had sent through Zechariah, and through David, mentioned in the Psalms, he was the fulfillment. And he would come to carry out the work that God had promised from the Garden of Eden when he said, I will send someone to crush the head of the serpent. All of that Jesus was announcing here on this event and on what we call Palm Sunday. What a glorious moment to be able to get to witness that fulfillment of um, such wonderful things promised so long ago. Well, let's do a little review 
So you have a couple of different activities in, in our lesson. The first seven questions are multiple choice. So you have a question and you're going to go back and you're going to fill out the correct one. Now, I'll just warn you, there are a couple of them that have more than one answer. Mm -hmm. So pay attention. Find that one that has more than one correct answer. There's uh, two for one of those. And maybe what we can do, Michael, is take a look at the true and false. There's a yeah. couple of the true and false ones that are a little bit tricky. So let's go through a couple of these true and false questions. Uh, since I want to be the tricky one, I'm going to ask Michael the ah. questions. All right, so Michael, question number one. Oh, boy. Jesus knew the donkeys were tied in the village because he had been there before. Now, that we did get to talk about a little bit, actually, so I'm not too worried about this question. Okay. However, it is a tricky one. Um, if you were paying attention right at the beginning of our lesson, you um, we talked about how it there was some speculation as to how exactly Jesus knew there was going to be this donkey there and these people there and exactly what the disciples should say. Um, and there's a couple theories, but we don't actually know which one it is. Because the scriptures just say that Jesus said that this was going to happen and then it happened. So nothing in the text really says that they Jesus had been there before. He knew um, the family. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't, don't know, know any of those things. Yep, we don't know. So it could it could have been, and it could have been that Jesus just knew. But I'm going to go ahead and say that that is false because we just don't know for sure. And part of the part of the benefit of these questions is simply to get us to talk about it and try to understand the lesson a little mm -hmm. bit better. And and so this one we might say, well, yeah, we we can't say whether it's true or false completely, at least not from the text. Uh, but like we said, we're going to find some other passages which we can see very clearly do demonstrate the omniscience of Jesus. So we know that he is true God and he reveals that and his knowledge in other cases. This probably isn't the best one for us to use as a proof text or as evidence mm -hmm. that Jesus was omniscient though. Yeah. Let's jump down to question number five in the true or false. The people wanted Jesus to be their earthly king. Is that true or false? Michael? Well, that is that is a tricky one. You are you're really going after me now. <laughs> um, partially I could say. Okay. Um, but this isn't something that you can just put true and false on. Um, some had a better understanding, so there's people there who knew that Jesus was God and that he was coming to establish an eternal heavenly kingdom, not some place on earth at Jerusalem. Um, but some people also thought that's exactly what Jesus was going to do. He's going to go over to the Romans and use some of his powers that he had used before in like feeding the 5,000. So they know he can do something. So they thought he was going to use that against the Romans. Um, and that wasn't the case, obviously. So with this one, it's tricky because there's probably a little bit of both. Now, the majority of the crowd might have thought Jesus was going to be an earthly king, but there were some that at least were growing in their understanding that Jesus was more than just an earthly king. Yeah. Let's do one more, Michael. How about number eight? One more trick one for you. Oh, boy. Jesus is happy when we go to church even if we don't listen. Hmm. What do you guys think about that? Well, I think on the surface that sounds good. But if you really, because it sounds good because hey, we're going to church, so that's that's a good thing. We're meeting up and we're sitting in front of pastor and we're not listening, but hey, we're there, right? So that should be good enough. But, but. if you look into scripture, there's a passage that says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And now that faith is what we need as Christians to be able to believe in Jesus and go into heaven. So if you aren't listening, then you're not learning. Yeah, you're not hearing, you're not, not hearing. learning. Um, so if you go to church and you don't listen, then is it really like you're attending church? 
So this is a little bit of a tricky one too, because yes, Jesus is happy when we go to church yeah. and he wants us to be in church, but he also wants us to be attentive. He mm -hmm. wants us to meditate on his word. He wants us to, to really be focused on, on our praises to him and his words to us. Yeah. And that's what's a little bit tricky about this particular true and false question too, is that Jesus does want us in church and he is happy when we're in church, but he's even more happy when we are paying attention, we are listening, we are meditating, and we are praising Him as as we should and with joyful hearts. Yeah. Not just because we have to be, mm -hmm. but because we want to be. Yeah. I think something that helps us, at least me, get a better willingness to serve Jesus and to listen is when we go through stuff like this and we see how every single thing that Jesus did on earth was to benefit you and to benefit us. Right. And so when I think about how much Jesus loves me and how much he sacrificed, remember we talked about that sacrificial love, it makes me want to pay attention and to get a closer relationship with Jesus because right. he has done so much for me. Yeah. So on the next page, page four, you, you guys might have noticed that this actually has five pages in it, so it's a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a couple of activities on page four. You're going to take your hymnal and look at a uh, hymn from the hymnal in the Palm Sunday section and what it talks about there. And then this week, you've got a, a really good your turn where you're going to apply what we have learned in honoring Jesus as king in your daily lives. Mm -hmm. How can you honor Jesus by talking to a friend who is doing something that they shouldn't be doing. How can you honor Jesus when you go to school? How can you honor Jesus in, in these, all these different areas of our life? And we get to, we get to honor Jesus mm -hmm. every, in everything that we do and everywhere that we go. But a lot of times we lose sight of that. So t take some time to discuss those your turn questions with maybe a sibling or your mom or your dad or a family member. Yeah. I think um, another thing that you can think about is we don't just only honor Jesus with our words by telling people about Him or by praying to Him. It's also with our actions. Everything that you do is a witness to what you believe in. Um, so if I am always walking around all grumpy and every time pastor says hi to me, I stomp on his foot and I walk away, that... Does that really sound, Do you, would somebody look at me and say, oh, that guy is a Christian, he is a good person? Or would they say, ooh, I don't really know about him, he doesn't seem like he has his priorities straight? That wouldn't be a good thing, would it? So we, we reflect Jesus in the things that we say, mm -hmm. but also in the things that we do. Mm -hmm. Both of those things are important. Yeah. Also, this week, uh, for your Bible passages, usually your Bible passages are listed in your uh, Sunday school book. This week, they're not. So, this is going to take you a little bit more work than usual. What you're going to have to do is you're actually going to have to look those passages up in your Bible. The references are there, and part of the Scripture, ref or the scripture is there, mm -hmm. but you're going to have to look it up and then write all of the words in, and that's going to help you to memorize it. We've encouraged you in the past to write these things down because it helps you to, to memorize. Once you get all of those words written in there, then you're going to find those in the crossword find right next door. So there's a word find right, right beside it, and you're going to look for those words again. And, and just a, a thing to keep in mind, when you're filling out these, these three passages, you might have different Bible translations. And the Bible translations might have slightly different words. So the Bible translation that's used in your study is the New King James Version. So if you're using the NIV or the ESV or something else, the words might not be the same. And if you put the wrong words down, you're not going to find them in the word find. Mm -hmm. So you want to use a New King James Version Bible if you have that at home in order to look these up or if you're looking at it online. Another nice thing to, that you can think about and focus on as you get to know your Bible better is these different translations yeah. that are out there. Just a, another thing to help you better understand. Yep. Yeah. All right. So 
There's our lesson for today as we've reviewed Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. As Michael mentioned early on, we're getting ready to enter into what is called Holy Week. And over the next couple of weeks now, we'll be looking at different events that took place during these six days of Jesus' life that lead up to his death on Calvary and then his resurrection on Easter Sunday. So we're looking forward to having you with us as we really dig into this very important week in the ministry and the life of Jesus. Yeah, it's kind of neat. I don't mean to sidetrack a little bit, but this one week. So if you think about Jesus' entire ministry, his entire ministry from the moment that he was baptized by John until his ascension is three years. Um, But this Holy Week, five days covers over half of the Gospels. Um, So the four Gospels go through that three years worth of time, but just this one week takes up over half of each one, or just about half of each one of those. So it's so important, and so much is packed into it. So, like Pastor said, we're really excited to get into it. And this is really what his whole ministry was focused on. This Mm -hmm. This is the reason that he came. And so when we start to talk about Jesus not just talking about or or doing things, but what he actually came to do. It's not just healing people or or calming the seas or feeding mm-hmm. five thousands, but what he actually came to do was to suffer and to die. And that's going to be really what we're going to key in on over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. So the Lord keep you this week. Spend some time on your homework. Get some of those passages memorized. Yeah. Uh, make sure that you're doing the activities and discussing them with family members. And we'll look forward to seeing you again next weekend. Yeah. Take care.